Space, a beautiful place bigger than one can even perceive. And with all this new information coming out about aliens and UFOs being a straight up real fact, yes, you can go watch this for yourself. There's a two hour Congress meeting. The controller told us that these objects had been observed for over two weeks, coming down from over 80,000 feet, rapidly descending to 20,000 feet, hanging out for hours, and then going straight back up. For that has some very interesting and extremely scary information. And I have something to add to this to show you how terrible space really is, how small it can make you feel, and all the existential dread that you could possibly imagine, all right? There's a black hole about a thousand times our own galaxy size. I believe it is called Tau 1000, or at least something of that. But if you just look up giant black hole outside of the galaxy, I am, I'm sure you'll find it and you will be absolutely blown away, all right? This is, this is not okay. It is very close to us and it is a whole lot bigger than us all right this is the only thing that i can warn you of here but what we will be doing today is we'll be dipping back into spectro a one-shot storyline from the comic book industry known as aftershock a company that i really am very conflicted about as a lot of the times they have some semi-interesting stories and they have some other ones that are very lackluster all right i've never really read anything by them that has absolutely blown my mind they're mostly kind of just silly and fun one-shot stories like mother f goose and uh, a bunch of other ones that for some reason i keep buying these things because they come in these giant prints but overall at the end of the day they're only about five dollars and like i said they're either a very fun read or just something that's that's something else. But today's story will be about a young astrobiologist who will finally make their way to a space station hovering above Earth. And when she actually gets there, she may or may not learn about a new species that has been found on Mars. Whether this is an actual full-scale being, or just a virus, or maybe a simple bacteria, it is nonetheless the crowning achievement of mankind thus so far, at least in this timeline. And before we get into this, I just want to give everybody a huge thank you. We have finally reached 1,400 subscribers. I've been battling that 300 mark for so long and we finally just reached above it. So if you're new here and you'd like to help this channel grow, please like the video, hit the bell, go check out some of the other videos, and I thank you very much. And now, in the last video that I did from Aftershot Comic, we kind of learned about how Pluto is actually a very achieved planet. It is a very successful planet and it is a planet that can kind of eliminate anybody in its path when it's needed to. It is a very fulfilling set of skills, and you might just want to go watch that video for a little bit of context, otherwise, you know, what I just said isn't going to make any sense. But with this next story from Spectro, we will be dealing with an astrobiologist who has finally reached the crowning point of her career. As we suddenly cut to a panning shot of Earth itself, and then once her overwhelmed eyeball, as she finally is getting to see just how small she is compared to just her own home planet alone. Beautiful, isn't she? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what? The Earth. Not many people get to see her splendor. And suddenly, her concentration is broken by the new ship captain coming up to greet his new subordinate. Oh, right, of course, I'm sorry, I'm just extremely overwhelmed. Ha! I was counting on it. Ron Olcom, commander of the Oasis Space. And you are Dr. Tessa Neverett, our latest and shiniest astrobiologist. Your work on biospheres and isotopic molecular identifiers is simply a doozy. Why, thank you, sir. I've, I've dreamed of this my entire career, but I wasn't prepared to see the Earth like this. Call me Ron. I always make the new arrivals visit the observation deck before formal introductions anyway. It's a mule kick to your soul. Right. A cognitive shift in one's perception of our place in the universe and the fragility of our existence. I read about this, but no need for words. Just take it all in. And if you are somebody who's actually watched William Shatner go aboard of the Blue Origin, the giant rocket that is powered by Jeff Bezos and Amazon Prime alone, you will see very much how this is a very real thing. How his mind is completely blown, and how he basically cannot stop saying, Oh, Jesus. <laughs> no description. Oh.
Yes, very funny, but completely understandable, as I do believe that I would be doing this exact same thing, just losing my fucking mind over the giantness of actually being outside of the Earth, something I could not imagine whatsoever. Like being outside of the map of a video game, like being somewhere where you were never meant to be. Well, this is no longer the case, obviously, because we've been going outside of the planet's boundaries for quite some time, but I'm guessing that no matter who you are, your first trip outside of the border of the atmosphere must be pretty overwhelming. Oh, yeah. And Captain Ron here is about to add a little bit more of this overwhelming feeling to his new subordinate with a little bit of information about something new that they have found. What have you been told about this assignment? Nothing, sir. I, I mean, Ron, I was just told that my expertise was needed on the new dawn. Indeed. Two weeks ago, we received the first cache of core samples excavated by the ExoMars rover. Preliminary analysis revealed some unexpected results. How so? Evidence of microbial life. And suddenly, the young astrobiologist is completely blown away, realizing that finally alien life has been found, and whether, like I said, this is some sort of seven or eight foot being found in the backyard of somebody in Las Vegas. There's like an eight foot person beside it, and another one's inside, and it has big eyes and looking at us, and it's still there. Okay, where is this on your property? Uh, in my backyard. Or just merely a living dust mite. This is an absolutely outstanding find in the vastness of space in our next door neighbor, Mars. And as Ron Holcomb continues to go on, this space cadet man that I've been doing this silly little voice for, he kind of tells her, you know, that this isn't even just some kind of dead thing that we found. It is actually living. This is the first source of living life on Mars. And this is where things will start to kind of begin to get a little wacky. As we see our young subordinate just keep going on about how she craves to test these samples, how she needs to look them in their, in their living eyes to see the dust of Mars upon their wriggling bodies. Based Basically, she just keeps getting directed away from this, all right? And this is where things I just don't really understand. As when she continues to keep babbling on about how she needs to kind of inspect this little thing, Ron Holcomb begins to tell her that you are missing all of the foreshadowing. Oh, I have every intention of letting you inspect the organisms, Dr. Navarrett. Up close and personal. And something shoots out of this man's hands, all right? It looks like these weird black tendrils, almost like little hairs growing out in a very lovely locks, I must say. And also, for some reason, Ron Holcomb's hands are now bloody. And Miss Navarrett immediately notices that obviously something is going wrong, that something organic is growing out of this man's body. Oh, this? Don't worry. It's not my blood. It's the stain of mankind's sacrifice. You could say I've been infected by an alien virus, but to wit, doctor, I'm experiencing an evolutionary apotheosis. A realization that humans are not worthy to engage the cosmic nature of the universe. You are a viral species existing in a process of slow decay, exposing progress while bringing death to everything you touch. But do not fret. Although your consciousness is a flawed mutation, your bodies will be useful to us. And from this point on, Tessa begins to run as fast as she possibly can. And this will inevitably be the downfall of this strange alien virus that has taken over Ron Holcomb's brain. As he decides he is going to do the classic horror side thing where he is just going to walk very casually, all right? He's feeling very confident. He knows that he's going to be able to get to this lady, but this is almost always the downfall of the villain, isn't it? As he takes his sweet, sweet time to kind of narrate this little speech that he's got in his head to continue to go on about how he is a superior being and that Tessa is just some kind of weird mutation that should have never happened on Earth anyway. Basically, what he needs to do is to kind of take over everybody's bodies and to have Hugh and down on Earth sent some help so he can slowly make his way back to the planet. And as Tesla continues to run, Holcomb follows behind, and they enter the next room, where we see every single staff member of the ship completely dead, covered in these weird tendrils and blood. As the alien continues to go on about his plan to actually have help sent here, so he can make his way back. Although I need hosts, I needed a narrative even more, an excuse to make your superiors send help. I'll be the sympathetic all-American hero who used his grit to stop a psychotic killer. You humans love stories that subvert the nature of reality. And as he continues to go on, basically Tesla gets on the computer, and she makes the ship change course just a little bit, heading towards the sun, in a plan that essentially the alien could have stopped a long time 
time ago, but like I said, following the classic horror route, decides that he is going to just talk all over this. He's a little bit too confident, and this is essentially his demise. As suddenly all the computers kick on, and a giant echoing alarm goes off across the entire ship, letting them know that the heat is rising, alright? You could say that the heat is on. No! What have you done? Sending you to hell. No! And with the next couple of panels, we just see this overwhelming light come over through the bridge of the ship, and Dr. Ron Holcomb is dead now, all right? He's sending in the shraps. He goes into his anime moment where we see nothing but the silhouette of his body. Well, a giant beam or blob of energy passes over him. And somehow, in just this mere couple of seconds, Dr. Tessa has made her way out, all right? We cut to the next panel as we see the giant space station crashing towards the surface of the Earth while she sits in a spacesuit, just kind of sitting back and watching all this unfold. And while this is the end of our story, I gotta say, one of the dumbest endings that I've seen in a while, as you would think that something like this, a biological creature that takes over other bodies, why would you want to crash this into your planet? This is the thing that this creature wanted. Are you telling me that there's no possible way that maybe it could lodge itself in some water on the ship to maybe keep the heat away long enough to crash into the ocean or crash into a mountain and be unleashed onto everything. I forget what movie it was that I recently watched where it was kind of about a weird blob being found out in the middle of space or on the moon or maybe on some different planet. And while it started off very cute, over time it grew larger and larger until it took over everything. And it does kind of remind me of this just a little bit. I almost want to say it's called Life. I don't know. If you can Google everything I just said and find that movie, it was a very, it was a good watch. It was a good watch. But yes, everybody, this has been the end of it, and this is Spectro. There's about two or three more stories that I have not covered out of it. I gotta say, the first one is very good. It's about a futuristic city where a man is kind of trying to lose weight with this new AI program. And let's just say, it just does not go well for him, alright? And another side note, I do want to say that I do appreciate Aftershock Comics. If you're a person like me who loves one-shot stories, little bits of information that you don't need to read, like 10 other books to fully understand the atmosphere and everything that has happened previously, it's very interesting. And they do come up with some interesting concepts. I just think by the end of them, every single time, they're just not executed in the most fulfilling way ever. But I've only read maybe five or seven different ones by them. And I'm sure there's one out there that's going to absolutely knock it over the head. But yes, everybody, this will probably be a shorter video as I'm trying to kind of rack up some content so I can go ahead and do a bigger story. Maybe maybe some sort of Constantine or Swamp Thing or maybe an older Batman story. I'm not quite sure yet. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you all for watching. I know this probably isn't the best episode. It's not the greatest story whatsoever, but I'm hoping that I managed to make it at least semi-entertaining, and I hope you enjoyed my William Shatner-esque voice. But everybody, I will see you on the next episode of From the Heart, with more stories and more terrible, terrible demonic things to come next. Have yourself a fantastic day. <laughs> oh my god.